Hey everybody and welcome to today's video lecture. In this video lecture we'll discuss improving your delivery. And as always let's start out with a question. The question is this, what happens if a presenter has poor delivery? Well the answer is varied, but all of the answers are bad. The best case scenario is that you will politely bore your audience, they'll look like this poor pup here. The worst case scenario is that your audience will be actively bored, like this yawning kitty here. So to avoid either of these negative outcomes, you want to focus on enhancing and improving your delivery. But remember that in presenting as an architecture, form must follow function. And what I mean by that is that no matter how good your delivery is, it cannot substitute for structure. Good delivery enhances good structure, but it doesn't substitute for it. You can be the most energetic, the most dynamic, the most polished presenter in the world, but if you don't have good structure, if you don't have a good slide deck, if you don't have good content, your presentation is not going to work. Presenting is the sum of many skills, and it only works when all of those skills come together. Now let's talk about the specific contents of today's video lecture. We'll start out by talking about some strategies for dealing with nervousness. Next we'll talk about managing your body and voice, we'll talk about eye contact, we'll talk about the appropriate speed and tone of your presentation, we'll talk about stances, we'll talk about gestures, and then finally we'll close by talking about how you can avoid weak language when presenting. Let's start by discussing dealing with nervousness. Now undoubtedly there are many tips and techniques out there for dealing with nervousness when presenting. After all, public speaking is one of people's most common fears and anxieties, but I want to focus on seven tips and techniques today. So first, you can take deep rhythmic breaths before your presentation. We know that breath exercises are a great way to deal with stress and anxiety in other aspects of life. The same rule applies in presenting. Second, you can move around and get your blood flowing. Moving around before your presentation provides you with an outlet for some of that nervous energy, and it also generates feel-good chemical reactions in your body. And if you feel good, you're more likely to feel confident. Third, you can visualize in advance what a successful presentation will look like. Fourth, you can think of your presentation as an opportunity to help your audience. If you feel awkward asking your audience for something, think of it in different terms. Imagine that you're not trying to get something from them, but instead you're trying to give something to them. Similarly, you can think of your presentation as part of a conversation rather than as a performance. A performance is something unusual for most of us. It's outside of our everyday experience, but we have conversations all the time. So if you think of your presentation like a conversation, it will feel much more routine and you'll feel much less nervous. Tip six, harness your nerves and channel that energy into your presentation. Use your nervous energy to appear dynamic to your audience. And then lastly, and most importantly, practice your presentation until the words come naturally. The less mental energy that you have to devote to thinking of your words as you're presenting, the more confident you will feel. And you only get to that point through practice and rehearsal. Next, let's talk about managing your body and your voice, starting with eye contact. In general, you want to maintain two to three seconds of eye contact with your audience members, and then you want to look elsewhere, right? So, so look around the audience, find somebody who's looking at you, make two to three seconds of eye contact, and then move on. Repeat that cycle on and on and on throughout your presentation. 
Maintaining that two to three seconds of eye contact is really crucial. Less than two to three seconds, and you'll appear nervous and jumpy. More than two to three seconds, and you'll appear creepy. All right? Additionally, when presenting, you also want to avoid looking at the floor or at the podium. You want to avoid staring at the horizon. You want to avoid scanning the audience quickly, which is again going to make you appear nervous or jumpy. And then finally, you want to avoid fixating on the screen or monitor. That's a great way to sap your presentation of all energy and dynamism. Now, the exception to this is if you're recording your presentation, as of course I am doing right now. In that case, you want to maintain uh, sustained direct eye contact with the camera lens. And I can say from experience, that's going to feel weird. But it's also going to make your audience feel more connected to you and therefore is very much worthwhile. Next, let's talk about the speed and the tone of your presentation. In general, you want to speak a little bit more slowly than you would ordinarily, and you want to speak clearly. You also want to use a conversational tone. And as a result, your presenting voice should sound like a polished version of your normal voice. You want to sound like yourself, but you want to sound like yourself at your very best when you're presenting. In addition, you want to use vocal inflections that match your content and that help you maintain your audience's interests. To achieve that, you want to speak faster to signal urgency, to signal excitement, to signal emotion, and then you want to slow it down to signal seriousness or significance. Whatever you do, though, avoid a rehearsed and robotic tone. That just makes your, your, your presentation feel boring and it saps it of all its energy and dynamism. Now let's talk about stances. In general, when you're presenting, you want to assume what we call the power stance. The power stance is when you align your feet with your shoulders, right? So stand with your feet shoulder width apart. It's when you put your arms at your side, at least when you're not gesturing. It's when you pull your shoulders back, and it's when you avoid swaying and rocking. That combined is what we call the power stance. Now, if you feel your shoulders curling forward, which I know is a big problem for me, you are no longer in the power stance. If that's happening, just gently push those shoulders back, not to a comical degree, but at least to a comfortable degree. You also want to avoid stances that close you off or make you appear nervous, or defensive. And there are, of course, a number of problematic stances, but I nevertheless want to emphasize a few very common ones. So the first one is the fig leaf, and that's when you cross your arms or hands in front of your waist. It's, of course, named after those strategically placed fig leaves in Renaissance and medieval paintings. Similarly, we've got the core protector, which is like the fig leaf, but instead of crossing your arms or hands in front of your waist, you, you instead do so in front of your abdomen. Uh, we also commonly see what I call the floating core protector, which is crossing your arms or hands in front of your, your abdomen, but a few inches out from your body. It's just kind of a, an unnatural posture to be in throughout a presentation. You want to avoid what I call the Alexis Rose, named in honor of the, the wonderful Schitt's Creek character. Uh, Alexis Rose is famous for holding her hands uh, up in front of her chest, uh, almost like a bunny, so avoid that one. Uh, you want to avoid the forklift. This one makes you look very robotic when you have your arms crooked at a 90 degree angle out at your sides. You want to avoid the Twizzler when you're crossing your legs. You want to avoid the angsty teen when you cross your arms in front of your body or even just put one arm across your body. You want to avoid the Superman when you're standing with your arms akimbo or with one hand on your hip and a, a hip popped. Uh, you want to avoid the sheath, which is what I call putting your hands in your pocket when presenting. And 
You also want to avoid the older Frenchman, which is named in honor of my father-in-law uh, and many other uh, older Frenchmen who like to stand with their hands behind their back. And of course, you want to stand still. You want to avoid the Gene Kelly, which is my name for when uh, one presents while moving one's feet and legs all around, like the famous tap dancer Gene Kelly. Now, where should you stand when you're presenting? Uh, in general, you should step away from the podium. You're going to have to go back behind the podium from time to time. That's fine. I understand. But in general, you want to step away. By stepping away, you can eliminate the barriers between yourself and your audience, and that will make your audience feel more connected to you. You can also choose to move strategically, take a few paces, particularly when you're transitioning between one point and another. That physical movement will help signal to your audience that you're changing topics. But whatever you do, avoid pacing. Pacing just makes you look kind of crazed and nervous. So make sure that when you're moving, you're moving in a strategic and considered fashion. Now, of course, if you're recording your presentation, as I am now, you want to remain stationary. Movement on recorded presentations does not come across positively. Now let's talk about gestures. Gestures can serve a variety of purposes. They can make your presentation more energetic. They can make it more memorable. They can make it more persuasive. So please use gestures. They're great. When you're doing so, make sure that you're gesturing at either shoulder or chest level, whatever feels more comfortable to you, and match your movements to your content. Most importantly, though, I want you to gesture in a way that feels natural to you. Yes, be strategic about how you're using gestures, but don't use a gesture that you wouldn't ever use in your everyday life. Now, gestures come in a variety of forms, but we can lump most of them into two main categories. So we've got descriptive gestures and we've got emphatic gestures. Descriptive gestures are gestures that help your audience visualize your content. You got three points, hold up three fingers. That's a descriptive gesture. You're talking about something small, maybe you do this. If you're transitioning from one point to another, you move your hands from over here to over here. All of those are examples of descriptive gestures. They align with the content. They help your audience visualize the content of your presentation. Then you've got emphatic gestures, and you use these to reinforce your most important words and points. May I repeat, your most important words and points. All right, that's a kind of classic emphatic gesture. Now, you're probably going to use emphatics more than descriptive gestures, and that's fine. But just make sure, and we'll come back to this later, just make sure that you're not gesturing, particularly using those emphatics, in a way that is empty or meaningless. A few things to avoid. You want to avoid gestures that contradict your content. If you're talking about something big, you probably don't want to be doing this. You want to avoid fidgeting. Put your hands down at your side when you're not gesturing. Don't touch your nose. Don't touch your hair. Don't pick at your fingernails. Don't fidget. You want to avoid pointing at your audience. Pointing feels very accusatory. If you need to gesture in the direction of your audience, you can use the open-handed point or the thumb point, both of which feel much less accusatory than the finger point. You want to avoid gestures that may not transfer across cultures. This means okay in a U.S. business context, but I can assure you that in some parts of the world, that gesture means something that is most certainly not Okay, so be sensitive to the ways in which gestures vary in meaning from one part of the world to another. You want to avoid, as I said earlier, gestures that are repetitive or that lack meaning. You want to avoid gesturing like a T-Rex, which is when all of your gestures are right up here. Uh, that just looks a little funny. And then similarly, you want to avoid gesturing below your waist. Gestures that appear too low your audience won't even see them, and therefore they have basically no impact on 
your presentation. Now, if you're using a clicker, I'd also encourage you to avoid these common gestural mistakes. You want to avoid, first of all, the TV remote, which is when we point the clicker directly uh, at the screen as we're changing slides. You want to avoid the stab, which is similar to the TV remote, but in, involves a stab-like gesture as well. You want to inv uh, avoid the whip, which is when you whip your hand towards the screen as you're changing uh, the slide. And then finally, you want to avoid the frisbee, which is like the whip, but involves you turning your entire torso towards the screen as you change slides. When you change slides, just hit the button. Just hit the button and incorporate the button push into whatever other gesture you were already undertaking. And then finally, let's talk about some strategies for avoiding weak language. To avoid weak language, focus on your audience's interests and their needs. Talk to them in a way that is likely to resonate. It's that simple. More specifically, you want to use concrete language when you're presenting. Avoid generalities. Use specific words. They're going to feel more compelling, more concrete, more memorable, and more persuasive. You also want to avoid hedging phrases like, I think, I believe, or I wish, which sap your presentation of authority and dynamism. Perhaps most importantly, you want to uh, avoid overusing filler words like um, ah, like, right, or okay. I know this is a big problem for me. I'm sure it's a big problem for many of you as well. But fortunately, to avoid these filler words, we have a variety of techniques at our disposal. So first of all, we can practice our presentation. The more we practice, the more that our words are ready at hand, the more easily, the more fluently we will speak and the less that we'll have to rely on those filler words. You can also focus on identifying your problem words. My problem words are um and right. For many of you, it's going to be like. Be aware of what your problem words are and make a concerted effort to expunge them from your speech. Perhaps most importantly, slow down when you're presenting and use pauses and breaths to collect your thoughts. Oftentimes we insert these filler words into our presentation because we're collecting our thoughts. We're thinking about what we want to say next. That's natural. That's normal. It's fine. But when you're collecting your thoughts, don't fill that silence with an um, an ah, or a like. Just sit with the silence. Just breathe as you collect your thoughts and your words, and when you're ready, move on. Your audience won't notice for the most part, and most importantly, it will make you sound polished and confident. And that, my friends, brings us to the end of today's video lecture. We talked about dealing with nervousness. We talked about managing your body and your voice. We talked about eye contact, about speed, and tone, about stances, about gestures, and lastly, about avoiding weak language. We covered a lot of ground today. Remember that polish, energy, dynamism uh, in your delivery is crucial, but it is not the only thing to presenting. Yes, you want to focus on improving this area of your presentation skills but don't do so to the neglect of other elements, like the slide deck, like the content, like the structure. Good delivery skills enhance those other skills. They don't supplant them. Thanks everybody for tuning in today and good luck with your presentations.